home. For most, the word alone already brings warm feelings of comfort and security. It is said that a person's home is their castle. But what happens if someone breaks into your castle? And what happens if you're alone? It's time to get comfortable. And keep those ears perked in case of intruders now. And let the darkness take control. I was 12. And my older sister and I were home alone for the weekend. I was waiting for a friend to pick me up. And getting restless. There was a knock on the door. Thinking it was her. I ran to answer it without checking through the peephole. A man was standing there with a clipboard and said he needed to check our gas meter. I was entrenched in the disappointment of my friend still not having arrived. So I just told him, yeah, sure, whatever you need to do. I didn't notice at the time, but he wasn't dressed as a city official. He had on a green and purple shirt with bold stripes, like the host of Blue's Clues. He came in and immediately went up the stairs to where our bedrooms were and walked into the open door of my room, the typical girly girl room with pink and glitter. Thank God, my sister came down the stairs at almost the exact moment. She said, oh, is that Daphne's dad? What's he doing upstairs? And I complained about how Daphne wasn't here and was going on about how unbelievable she was when my sister cut me off. Wait, wait. If Daphne isn't here, who is that? I said, he's here to read the gas meters. Her face turned white. She flung open the front door and dragged me out hang clamped over my protesting mouth. She said, our gas meters are outside. Neither of us had a cell phone as it was the 60s and obviously weren't going back into the house to call the authorities on a landline phone. Then my ever resourceful sister had a stroke of genius. A man was walking right by our house and she motioned him over. She called loudly into the house. Oh, Dad, it's good you're home. A man from the city is here to read the gas meters upstairs. And just like she'd hoped, this man on the street said, What are you talking about? The man in the striped shirt bolted out the house. The man on the street asked us repeatedly if we were okay, if we needed him to stay and wait in the yard until our parents came home. He was sweet. We were so startled that we barely thanked him before slamming and locking the doors and windows. As irate as my sister was that I let someone in the house, she begged me not to call the police because our parents had left her in charge and she was worried that she would get in trouble. I didn't want to catch any heat from carelessly allowing some guy in, so I was on the same page. Three weeks later, a girl in our community went missing. It was the same situation. She was home alone and authorities found the door open and no signs of forced entry. My sister and I discussed our options, but deep down we had no choice but to come clean. We told the police everything. I don't know if it helped, but they did tell us they had reason to believe it was the same man. They also tracked down the man who helped us on the street. Turns out we already knew him. He worked in the butcher shop. We just didn't recognize him. He was lifelong friends with the family after that. Our parents were mortified. They weren't angry with us. They were just glad that we were okay. Though they did review all the rules of caution and didn't leave us home alone again for a while. They found the girl. They say she'd been held for a few days and then burnt alive. They never caught the man, but fear not. He was what appeared to be in his early 30s in the 1960s, 
So in any case, he has to be dead by now. I just thank God every day for my sister's resourcefulness and quick action. I live in a rural desert and have to take long, mostly desolate roads to get to the nearest town. I am a 30 year old female, about 125 pounds and 5 foot 5, and at the time I was 28. One day whilst driving towards town, I was only about 5 miles from home, so I had another 15 miles before I reached the town. I made a right hand turn and noticed a dark blue, newer, Dodge Charger station wagon, driven by a 20 to 30 something year old bald man, getting ready to turn left on the same street as me from the opposite way I was coming. He got behind me and immediately started tailgating me. It's a long flat stretch of road with no other cars, so he could have easily passed me. I was going at least 10 miles per hour over the limit, so he didn't really need to ride my ass. He wasn't going to pass me, and I didn't want to pull over, because my dad always told me never to do that, as some people take advantage of people that way. We are approaching a small hill where you cannot pass, and I saw a van driving on the opposite side, just coming up over the hill. The jerk behind me decided it was the perfect time to pass me. He was gunning it around me, and I was terrified, because I felt we were going to wreck. I freaked out, as I realised we would all crash, so I eased on my brakes to give him room to pass me. I saw the van swerve to the side of the road and slow down. What I didn't realise was that the jerk had gotten back behind me when I braked, but since he had been in my blind spot I didn't see him. He was pissed from that, and so he kept getting closer and closer to my bumper, as if trying to scare me. I looked back and saw that the van had stopped, probably shaken up. The guy finally speeds up and passes me, but then immediately starts to break in front of me, slowing me down. I tried to get around him, but he continually stopped his car in the middle of the road to block both lanes. No matter what I did, he kept thwarting my efforts to move anywhere. I was terrified, and decided to just turn around. I looked back, and the van was still on the other side of the road, and I kind of felt relieved as I was thinking there can be a witness in case this guy hurts me or causes a wreck. I tried to turn around, but he kept positioning his car to block me in. I was wishing another driver would come along to stop him, but no one else was coming, and this van was staying about 200 yards behind me. Finally, I got my bright idea to pull up my phone and take a picture of his car and license plate. So I did. And at that moment, I noticed that he was able to see me from his mirrors. This seemed to piss him off as I snapped pictures, so he finally sped off. I waited for some time to decide to just head to town and not to let this jerk dictate my decisions. I drove forward and looked out for him on the dirt roads that crossed the road, but fortunately, didn't run into him after this. About a mile down, I got to the road I needed to turn left at. When I looked to the right of the road, as I was approaching it, I saw his car parked on the corner. This tall, muscular, bald jerk in a neon green tank top then ran out of his car into the road in front of me and tried to take a picture of my car. The jerk had been waiting for me. As I took a fast left turn, he was still taking pictures of me. I drove off as fast as I could, and luckily he didn't follow. But I'm sure he got a picture of my license plate. 
I was shaken up and thinking I should call the cops as I had a license plate and description. I got to the store and called the cops and gave them all the information I had. They said they would look out for him. But since it had been 10 minutes since I'd last seen him, I couldn't tell them where he would be now, only where I last saw him. They took my name, address and phone number for the report of the information and to contact me later, I suppose. I went on with my day and got home without any incident. I didn't see him anywhere and felt relieved. Now I live alone with only one neighbor close by, but he's never home as his primary residence is in another town. I'm off a three mile dirt road out in the boonies. I do however have a dog, Stinky, and he is very protective of me in the land. That night, I was home alone with my dog, as always, and watching TV. I am an idiot and have no curtains or blinds on my two main windows in the living room. I was sitting on the couch and it was dark out and suddenly my dog perked up out of deep sleep and started towards the window. I began to panic as no one should be out this way. The road is a dead end at my driveway. So if anyone is out there, it wasn't good. He started growling in a low rumble and his ears and fur were standing on end. He can be very vicious with strangers and protects me in the house at all costs. I felt a lot safer with my doggy, but I was still pretty scared. I have gravel all around the house, so you can hear when people are walking around. I turned off the TV and lo and behold, I heard footsteps fairly close to the window. It sounded like they were trying to be quiet, but it's hard to conceal those sounds in gravel. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I told them I heard someone outside and that I was scared and home alone. I gave them my address and they said they were sending a unit out to my house. I'm very far out, so I knew this was going to take a while. I didn't hear anything, but I was afraid the person was just hiding or keeping still. I yelled out towards the window. The cops are coming and I have a gun. I do have a gun, but it's a .22 rifle and only use it to shoot pests in my garden. I still didn't hear anything, but suddenly the dog went into full bark mode and went nuts. He scratched at the door for some stupid reason, panic I suppose. I didn't think to grab my rifle. I was just listening out for anything, but I couldn't hear a single thing over Stinky's barking. I heard the sirens far off in the distance and knew they'd have a three mile drive of hard gravel ahead of them. Finally, the cops arrived and searched around. The guy was long gone. They saw footprints that did look larger than mine, but there were so many around that it was hard to tell. There was no damage or evidence of breaking in or anything, or any other signs of the guy. I told the cops what happened earlier that day and asked if it could have been the guy. How could he have got my address since I didn't see him following me home? They said unless he was law enforcement or military, that it was very unlikely. They thought that it could have been a burglar as there had been a few in a nearby town, but I didn't really believe it and I'm sure they said it to try and calm me down as I was shaking. They gave me their card number and said to call if anything came up. They said they'd been patrolling the area due to some things that they said they couldn't share with me. They suggested if I wanted to stay with someone else or have someone go over. I have no friends nearby at this time of night anyway. So I said I'd stay and hoped I'd scared the guy off. I stayed up late with my dog and my rifle. I also called my best friend one state away and we talked for most of the night and she helped me calm down. Luckily, nothing else ever happened and I've never seen the jerk again, nor has anyone been near my property. But I still think it was the same guy 
trying to act out his revenge one final time. This story happened about a year ago, and it was pretty out there even for me. I was about 20 at the time that this occurred, and I am a female. So last year, I moved back in with my dad, after having lived out of state for some time. At the time, my stepmom, little half-sister, stepbrother, Jay, and his girlfriend, Cam, and her child, Leela, were also all living there too. My stepmom has a way of just letting people live in my dad's house, and my dad has no balls and doesn't say anything, until something big happens, which it always inevitably does. So, not long after I moved in, my stepbrother was kicked out for illegal activity, but Cam and Leela stayed with us. I think, to my stepmom, Cam was this perfect person, and I don't really know. Just for a side note, Leela was Cam's daughter, but not my stepbrother's kid. No relation at all. Now Cam was about 18 at the time, and Leela was a little over two. Cam and I became loose friends because we were living together, and I would help babysit Leela when Cam had to go to work. Eventually, we both got boyfriends. She started dating a guy she met at work, and I started dating someone who I knew from high school. I thought her new boyfriend was great, but the terms of him visiting were kind of weird. He was legitimately visiting his girlfriend, who was living in her ex-boyfriend's parents' house. Kind of weird, but whatever. So little by little, I start noticing that my stuff was disappearing. Small stuff at first, like socks or panties. Mainly thongs. The kind of stuff you just assume gets lost in the wash. But then my perfume started to go missing. Suddenly, jackets, dresses, shoes and jeans and bras were also missing. Now, sometimes I would find these things in her room, and other times, she would suddenly appear with them after I mentioned not being able to find something. On days, I would come home and find a large amount of stuff missing. Cam would make up wild stories about Jay breaking into our house when no one was home to steal girls' clothes. Yep, she tried to get me to believe that. Even went as far as bending out of a window screen and breaking the window lock to try and prove this. This honestly wasn't the most extreme thing Cam did to try and get me to believe her insane stories. Eventually, we got into a big argument because my brand new car had been messed with and I basically accused Cam of going through my car and taking my stuff. Now, while Cam was younger, I was somewhat scared of her. I am very thin and petite, so I don't put up much of a fight. But Cam was taller and stronger, and had already struck me on occasions prior to this. So, in retrospect, any angry accusation was probably a bad idea, since it was just us and one of her friends home. Cam threatened to beat me senseless, among other colourful things, and I eventually backed off and left. Things went back to normal for a day or so, until one night, Cam literally freaked out, because her boyfriend was out of town, and I was hanging out with my own boyfriend. So she had nobody to give her attention. 
Now, when I say freak out, I mean Cam started claiming she was pregnant by her boyfriend in an attempt to make him come home. Problem was, Cam's boyfriend was going to school to be a doctor and knew that since she was still recovering from a personal medical condition, it was literally impossible for her to be pregnant, especially not the amount of weeks she was trying to say she was. So he called me and had me search the house for a supposed pregnancy test, which is disgusting by the way, but I couldn't find one. So he confronted Cam over the phone about it, and she admitted that she was lying because she wanted him to come home. I'm going to add that he had been gone for less than six hours at this point, and that he was visiting family only a few hours away. So he told Cam he'd be back in a couple of days, and things seemed to settle down. Cam seemed to calm down, and I went to bed. Later that night, Cam's boyfriend called me again, going on about how Cam had called him, threatening to kill herself unless he came home right then and there, but that his car was messed up, and it was about 1am, and nobody was going to give him a two hour ride back home right now. So I go into Cam's room, and she's laying on her bed in the dark, and she has a pill bottle in her hand. She's rambling about how she wants to die, and that she wants her boyfriend, and that if he doesn't come, she will just kill herself. And she doesn't care that Lila won't have a mother. Well, I freak out wake up my stepmom who basically yells at Cam to throw up any of the pills she's taken and then goes back to bed. Great family, right? So yet again, Cam admits about lying about the pills and was just hoping her boyfriend would come home to get her. As if he thought she was going to kill herself, he'd have to come then and there. Foolproof plan, right? Well, he didn't come, obviously, and Cam calls Jay to come pick her up and rides off with him, leaving Leela behind. I put Leela in my parents' room, in her playpen, and then I left because I was done. But apparently, Jay dropped Cam back off later, and her boyfriend, who had finally gotten a ride into town, finds Cam cheating on him with Jay. They got into a fight, and then I guess Cam started with the whole suicide thing again. So her boyfriend called the police and had her Baker acted, which is basically when they lock up people threatening self-harm in a psych ward for 72 hours to get them to calm down. Alright, here is the point where it gets kind of crazy. So after Cam got Baker acted, myself and two friends went through Cam's room and found a lot of missing stuff from all of us hidden away and sometimes even stuffed in Leela's diaper bags or toy boxes. One of the friends also warned me and they went and showed me that Cam had mixed a tropical ingredient I was severely allergic to in my body wash which could have hospitalized me for that kind of exposure. Cam had also peed in my shampoo and body spray, put blue dye in my toothpaste in an attempt to dye my mouth blue, and put green dye in my conditioner in an attempt to get me fired for having unnatural hair colour. Thankfully, I hadn't showered at home in two days, so none of it ever got used. The toothpaste I had noticed beforehand, and went ahead and replaced both that and my toothbrush without using it, which turned out to be a good thing because Cam had also supposedly thrown my toothbrush in the toilet. But here's the icing on the cake. Cam worked at a hospital and had somehow 
gotten her hands on one of those drinks that you empty into someone's cup and then that goes on to empty their entire system i.e. an extremely powerful laxative I think it's one of the ones that they make you have just before a colonoscopy she had planned to put it in my next drink next time I left it out just to make me really sick because I accused her rightfully so of stealing my stuff Cam also tried to tell people that my boyfriend was coming on to her and talking to her behind my back which was a complete lie the amount of charges I would have filed against this girl was insane but I opted not to because my dad and stepmom while thinking it was serious didn't think it would be morally right since Cam was obviously not okay in the head I was also pretty pissed that Cam's friends had waited until Cam had gotten locked up to tell me all about this stuff and would have knowingly let me get sick and possibly die because of what Cam was tampering with but if you think it ends there you're wrong the day before she got released from the psych ward Cam had been calling me and the same two friends were begging us to come and collect her on the day that she was getting released however we all agreed that it was not in our best interest to do so so lo and behold her release day comes and nobody shows up to collect her I must have had eight or nine missed calls on my cell phone alone from her and I have no idea just how many times she decided to ring the other girls one of the other friends did text me though and say that she had finally given in and called the psych ward but by the time she called they told her that Cam had apparently left with a random guy who had a family member in the psych ward the friend also warned me that Cam was probably going to try and come to my house which was the same friend who had been in on the tampering of my items and stealing of my stuff so I was a little torn on whether or not to believe her but I decided to go around the house locking all the doors and windows and closing all the curtains and blinds I seriously doubted she would be dumb enough to come to my house after my parents had called the psych ward and told them that she was no longer welcome at our address and that when she was released they needed to make sure she went to her mother's house a few towns over as we had already sent all of her stuff back to her mother but still the same I wanted the house to be secure since I was home alone well either Cam didn't get the memo about not being allowed at my house or she just got it but just didn't give a shit it's about 10 o'clock in the morning and I am sitting in the bathroom straightening my hair when all of a sudden I hear someone legitimately pounding on the front door it startled me so badly I dropped my incredibly hot straightener on my foot it wasn't just a one-time hit and then it stopped the pounding continued on without end almost rhythmically now my bathroom is on the other side of the house from the front door so once I recovered from the initial shock I flipped off the bathroom lights and ran into my bedroom my theory was that if the house looked empty maybe Cam would just give up and go back to her own home my car was in the driveway sure but I often left my car behind to ride carpool with co-workers or my boyfriend would pick me up to go out it was probably naive of me to think that she would just give up but you can't blame a girl for hoping well pretty soon Cam's pounding became relentless and she started yelling as she was pounding 
Being on the other side of the house, I couldn't make out most of what Cam was saying. But I was really hoping the doors held up to her fists. We had those stupid, mostly glass double doors at the front, and I was beginning to wonder if Cam was just considering breaking the glass in order to get in. So I frantically started texting my stepmom and dad, asking them what I should do. Of course, there is absolutely no reply, since they were both at work and were over an hour away from the house. So basically, I'm full on panicking trying to decide if I should hide and wait it out or call the police. My boyfriend worked night shifts, so he was still asleep and I felt completely and utterly alone like I had never felt so terrified all alone at once. The feeling was pretty indescribable. Well, after about 20 minutes of relentless pounding, it stops, and I think that perhaps Cam has given up. I started to stand up from where I had been crouched, when suddenly I heard my name being called. She started yelling, saying that she knew I was in there, and to open the bloody door, followed by another barrage of pounding. But this time, it was coming from my bedroom window. Cam was literally feet away from me, only separated by a thin glass window, which thankfully was covered by a very heavy curtain. I was already beginning to think, that she would smash through that window. Just because she assumed I was in there and had not replied to her at all. Cam then moved to the side of the house and tried the bathroom window and then switched back to the front door in record time. She must have been running laps around the house in order to pull it off. This went on for another 20 minutes or so and I was beginning to wonder if the windows were going to be able to manage her assault for much longer. Then suddenly it got really quiet. Her yelling turned into soft whining, like she was going to cry. She called my name again, asking for me to let her in. She said, We were friends. I don't understand why you're doing this. She started to say something else. But then she started laughing an evil, sickening laugh. Like, she couldn't keep the act up anymore and then fell completely silent. Taking advantage of the silence, I moved out into the kitchen, so that I could have access to an escape route should I need one. You see, my kitchen is at the centre of the house. From the kitchen, I could easily get to my garage door, to the front door, and the patio deck doors. Not only this, but I could easily get to what was once Cam's room, which also had a door to the patio deck in it. Now, I didn't dare try running for my parents' room, as I would have had to pass the front doors in order to get there. But I was really wishing I could, because that's where all the guns were. Not that I would have shot Cam, but it would have been very nice to feel at least somewhat protected. Suddenly, the silence gave way to the loud slam of the back gate, and then I realised that Cam is now on the patio deck. I held my breath as Cam went and checked every door, including the one that went into her former bedroom. She actually spent a fair amount of time on this one, I guess hoping it would break loose or something. Or maybe there was some trick to try and get it open that I didn't know about. But when that didn't work, Cam began screaming. She wasn't really saying anything, just yelling out sounds. It was honestly quite eerie, and I remember feeling like I was in some twisted horror movie. I hear our heavy metal patio furniture getting thrown around and the sound of glass shattering as one of the tables connected with the concrete. There were also a couple of splashes, as the table and some of the chairs ended up in the pool. 
I thought for sure, a chair was going to come flying through the sliding glass door at any minute. But then, as quickly as it had started, it stopped, and I heard the back gate slam shut. It had gotten silent again, until I heard a strange scratching sound. It took me a minute to realise what it was, but at that moment, I realised Cam had begun to fiddle with the windows in the bathroom that was attached to her old bedroom. It was one of those foggy shower windows that are somewhat small and closer to the ceiling than your average window. In an instant, I realised Cam had probably dragged a chair to stand on it in order to reach the window. I knew it was locked though. I had made sure that window was locked. Hadn't I? I suddenly began to panic, as I realised I couldn't remember if I had checked that window or not. Not to mention, Cam had already broken this lock once, so who's to say she couldn't have done it again? But I could still hear her huffing and yelling in frustration, so I was hoping she was struggling with it, and wouldn't be able to break it a second time. I had now moved back, and was cowered directly under the next door to the room that led into the garage. This one was the one place that was close to an exit, whilst also providing decent cover from every window. I felt safer, knowing she could not see me here, but also knowing that I had an escape route right there if I needed it. It had gotten quiet again, and I desperately, yet stupidly, hoped that this time, Cam might have really given up. I pictured her huffing and stomping back to whoever was waiting for her, and telling them to just drive her home to her mother's house. My stomach turned as I suddenly felt sick, as I realised she could have help. It would explain her getting around the house so fast, and the ability to throw such heavy furniture. I had completely forgotten that there was some random guy out there with her. I began to feel even more scared than I had before, and the need to run for it. That he might be waiting out there somewhere to grab me, and I began to rethink my escape plan, and started to think that perhaps hiding was better. All of this was interrupted when I heard the single most terrifying sound I had ever heard up till that point. You see, the handle on the door that led to what had formerly been Cam's room had gotten broken the night of her insanity, and you now had to fiddle with it to get it to open as the doorknobs didn't line up properly. And that was the sound I was hearing. Someone was shaking the doorknob ever so softly and quietly, but forcefully, trying to get the door open. I strained my ears as Cam struggled with the doorknob, before finally, a small click. She succeeded in opening the door, and I realised with terror that I was now in the house with Cam, and I had no idea if she was armed or what she would do if she found me cowering in the corner by the door, or if she had that guy with her. In retrospect, I really had no idea on much of anything. Without waiting another second, I burst through the garage door while simultaneously slamming my hand on the button to raise the door. I tucked and rolled under the door before it had risen completely scraping my knee in the process, and as I got to my feet, I saw a huge beefy guy standing by a truck near the edge of the driveway, watching me. He began to take a step towards me, and I took off running. I sprinted between houses, and up onto the golf course, where I was literally in the middle of all the golfers. Not that they gave two shits about a girl half-dressed crying. Once there, I called 911 and collapsed on the golf course as I waited for the police to show up. They came in without sirens, 
and asked me to walk up to the gatehouse at the front of the neighbourhood to meet me before they searched my house. As I walked up towards the gatehouse, I saw a truck driving out of the neighbourhood, and the guy driving kind of tipped his head in my direction and sped up past the cops. It happened too fast for me to get a license plate number, and when I told the police, they sent a singular cop car after the guy. But as far as I know, with no license plate, name, or much of a description other than white male driving a white truck, they never caught the guy. Unfortunately, this is where it gets anticlimactic. My stepmom showed up, having read my texts but didn't respond. She flew in the neighbourhood past me, and the cops, when she was soon followed by Jay. I was told they went in the house and found Cam ransacking my room while brandishing a kitchen knife. They calmed her down, and then my stepmom went outside. My boyfriend had showed up at this point, so he drove me back up to the house behind the police, who were still fully prepared to search. When the police strolled up to the driveway and to search the house, my stepmom made up some lie about how she had told Cam she was allowed to go to the house, that she'd forgotten to tell her about it, and that I had overreacted because of the way Cam acted the other night, and that I was prone to anxiety and being overdramatic, blah blah blah. It was all bullshit, basically. It was all a lie. A crock of shit. I was furious, and have never wanted to hit my stepmom more than I wanted to that day. She basically made me look like a complete idiot to the cops. My stepmom had Jay take Cam to her mum's house, and the cops basically treated me like I was a waste of their time and the stupid kid that called the cops. They told me, with something like that, check with your family first before calling us next time and left as if I hadn't sent multiple texts to both my stepmom and dad. The cops around here aren't known for being amazing anyway, and they basically proved to me how incompetent they were that day. As for Cam, well, she got away with it all. She cyberstalked me for a while on Facebook and Instagram. Nothing threatening, but made sure she knew what I was up to and made sure I knew that she knew. One day about a month later, she actually did come back to the house to let my stepmom babysit Leela, and while she was in the house, she and her friends stole more of my shit, just to prove that she could, I suppose. Supposedly, she was telling people I didn't deserve the things I had, and that she didn't feel bad taking my stuff, because I had too much stuff that I didn't deserve. After that one though, my stepmom told her not to come to the house anymore, and cut off most contact with her. Recently, I heard Cam con some guy into marrying her after dating her for about a month, and they moved across the country to be near his family. Ironically, they moved into a town literally 45 minutes from where my biological mother lives, so I guess there is a small chance I could see her again. But I haven't heard anything from her in almost a year. Her friends still live around here and occasionally say shit to me or try and stir up problems. But I recently moved in with my boyfriend, so Cam no longer knows where I live and I've changed my phone number. I deleted all my social networks except for Reddit but did take an extended leave from my account. And that is pretty much it. I really hope never to meet that psychopath again. And honestly, above all else, I really hope you get the help you so desperately need. My boyfriend, who I live with, works as a teacher in a town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I, on the other hand, work from home. In late January of this year, 
We'd gotten in a pretty big fight about something stupid. I can't even remember what it was about. But it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other text, call, or anything the whole next day. So this afternoon, I was lying in bed getting work done. It was a Tuesday, and I was pretty sure his last class finished at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning surely he'd be home around 2.30. But around 1pm, I heard the front door open and close. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. It was normal for him to skip his last class every once in a while, so I really didn't think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally prepared for the awkward post-fight, hey, how's it going, conversation. So I continued to lie in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs in, but I could hear the heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been mid-fight, and I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of it all, I might have noticed how strange it was and how slow the footsteps were, or how long he spent walking around the living room. But I, caught up in the dramatics of the fight, didn't think about it. I was just lying there waiting, and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door, to be prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting for 24 hours, huh? Smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they had opened it, without entering the room. I jumped out of bed, ripped out my earplugs, and sort of froze for a few seconds whilst thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, could that have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason, I concluded that surely it was his mum or sister. So I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of women's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realised his mum and sister don't have keys and have never been to our place before. The landlady had never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I ran back into the bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There is a balcony connected to the bedroom, so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up, and I asked him if his mum or sister might have come over unannounced. He told me no, don't move, I'm calling the police. The police were there in a minute, and they searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was there by that point. It was weird though, nothing was missing from the apartment, despite us keeping a jar full of money right in the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight to the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked and left. Plus, you can't open that big wooden front door without a key. For a few days, my boyfriend and I were convinced it was just the landlady being nosy, and I began to feel better. Nevertheless, we demanded that the landlady change our locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone had used tools to break in. Then a day or two later, my boyfriend said he had something to tell me, and not to freak out. He told me that the orange kitchen scissors were missing. I obviously freaked. I tore the apartment apart looking for those scissors. It's been six months and they've been gone. So the whole thing is just creepy and weird. 
A stranger breaks into a nice apartment, but doesn't take anything valuable, not even the money jar sitting right by the entrance. They take the scissors from the kitchen, go straight to the bedroom, see that someone's in there and immediately leave. I never got to meet the person who opened the door. And I hope I never do. I was 19 at the time. And was at my local GameStop, browsing through the old PS2 titles. When I came across Silent Hill 2, which is one of the scariest games for consoles of that era, in my opinion. So for nostalgia, I purchased it. Now, mind you, if I play a horror game, or watch a horror movie, I want to set the mood for it to get my money's worth. My parents are out on date night, so I had the house to myself. So I wait until 11.45 to start playing. Beforehand, I had set my phone to vibrate and face down on my bed. Turned off all the lights, set the fan on my room to get chilly, and turned the volume up to play this manufactured in hell of a game. This made the game so shit your pants worthy, and wasn't a bunch of gimmicky jump scares, but the fact that for long periods of time, nothing would happen at all. So your anticipation of something to jump out of you, because you're hearing weird disturbing noises that you can't make out, foggy atmosphere, no weapons, and your imagination turns into the horror aspect of the game as the simplest thing begins to frighten you. Finally, the game picks up, and I'm over here shitting in my room for fear and terror. Dark corridors, monsters appearing from corners, rooms changing appearance after returning back from them, pyramid head raping other monsters as you hide out in the closet because why not? Eventually, I had enough considering I'd never played a true horror game by myself to that magnitude, and had to just call it quits, as I would triple consider to turn a corner. It was probably around 2am, when I decided to get a drink of water before bed from the kitchen downstairs. Downstairs, everything is pitch black and silent. I left my phone in my room since I could easily navigate the house in the dark and feeling around the walls like the true ninja I am. Out of nowhere, I hear a slam from outside my house whilst I was at my fridge. My body just freezes. Unexplainable noises were following me from the goddamn game, and me, without a bat or barbed wire, I then hear another slam seconds later, which jolts my body back to animation, and I bolt to my room again upstairs. As I am about to reach the staircase, I see multiple shadows just outside my window, and I literally think tonight will be the death of me. I begin to go upstairs, dropping my water bottle, when all of a sudden the doorknob starts being moved vigorously, and I hear low whispers, making my heart turn to stone. I misstep, slip, and come crashing back down the stairs in front of my door, which swings wide open, and I start screaming, covering my face. My parents are back home. They brought me back dessert from dinner and I haven't touched a horror game since that night. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would like to give a huge thank you to my amazing patrons. I know I don't say it often enough, but your help in supporting the channel is absolutely invaluable. Honestly, without your generous support, it would be a lot tougher to do what I do. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. The names you see on screen are all the awesome people who contribute to keep this channel running. If you're interested in becoming a patron, and perhaps chipping in as little as a dollar every month to keep the channel going, you can find the information in the description. Of course, it's completely optional, and please feel no obligation whatsoever. 
every single one of you is awesome. Today I am pleased to announce that I got my first delivery of awesome stuff that is going to be in the giveaway boxes very soon. And you know, they actually sent me more stuff than I ordered for free. So that's amazing and that stuff is going to be passed down to the lucky winners. I really hope you enjoyed today's video and if you did it would mean a lot to me if you could drop a like and a comment. It goes a long way in helping more people with a taste for spooks find my channel and to help it grow. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be up to date with everything I post. You know you're not going to want to miss it. If you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit page, which is of course available in the description. Please be sure to include as much punctuation, descriptive language and paragraphing as possible. That is extremely important as without paragraphs it's really hard to read a wall of text. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.